sending this card to the graveyard. You can cast a spell for free out of your graveyard. Into the discard pile. Graveyard. The discard pile. Graveyard. I'm Simon from Games Deconstructed, and let's talk about the graveyard. Graveyard, the discard pile, whatever you want to call it, is a zone like the hand deck or battlefield. Its main purpose, as stated, is to store cards that have been used up or defeated in battle. That is the theory, at least. But before we get to testing the limits of that theory, here's a couple interesting observations about the graveyard. First of all, cards in the graveyard are most often public information, similarly to cards on the battlefield. And that's the case for both you and your opponent. The main mode of adding cards to the graveyard, that is, playing them and using them up, requires for them to become public info as part of that process, and they keep that characteristic as they go to the GY. To make things consistent, cards entering the yard through other means, like being milled off the top of your deck, where they are not yet public information, also requires you to reveal them. Similarly to the hand, the graveyard also might contain cards that you can have access to, but only if an effect grants you explicit permission. In cases where these permission-granting effects are popular enough, it may even be referred to as a second hand. There's some key differences between the two though, like cards being added to them through different means, card draw, the usual, versus mill, discard, and stuff dying. Effects that add to one or the other may be costed differently as well, due to differences in ease of access to cards in these two zones. Most strategies would prefer having cards in hand over cards in the graveyard, as playing out of the hand is part of the core rules and it doesn't require any other game pieces to grant you permission. But it isn't hard to think of a couple of counterexamples to this claim as well. Like most named concepts in card games, the graveyard offers a bit of added design space by allowing cards to reference it. Put a card from your graveyard onto the battlefield and put a card from your hand onto the battlefield are technically very similar sounding effects, but they play out very differently, owing to the previously mentioned differences between the graveyard and the hand. One could, for example, be construed as saying, play a card you have drawn, while the other would be, play a card you've milled, discarded, or used already, and the differences between those methods of card acquisition will be reflected in how the final effect is judged by players. On a short side note, most games also feature a super graveyard of sorts. Once cards go there, they cannot ever be interacted with anymore, creating a key difference from the normal graveyard which, as we mentioned, you can't have access to. That would be Exile in MTG, the Lost Zone in Pokémon removed from play in Yu-Gi-Oh! and many, many others. These are created to allow for a more permanent destruction of cards in games where graveyard recursion is present. At least that's their initial purpose. Because it is my theory that given enough time, every card game will eventually grasp for that last bit of design space, and print cards that allow resurrecting stuff from these zones as well. A sort of super recursion, if you will, which kind of defeats the purpose of it being a final resting place for anything, instead making it a second graveyard by a different name. If this will eventually require the creation of a third giga graveyard, even more inaccessible remains to be seen. In most card games, graveyard interactions are not a core mechanic of the game, instead being a playstyle you can choose to opt into. Specific rules printed on cards, rather than general rules printed in the rulebook. Circling back to the theoretical purpose of the graveyard I alluded to in the beginning of the video, the graveyard is stated to be a place used up cards go to and become less playable, less active as a result. A card in hand you can play, a card on the field you can play with, a card in yard sounds like a bit from My Fair Lady. Rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. A card in yard kind of stays there, 
anything extra is the result of you putting cards in your deck that do more with it. Specific rules that override the general. But in theory, a default card game deck doesn't really interact with the graveyard beyond putting stuff in it. That's the theory, but the reality differs a good bit, as it often happens, as most of the major card games have explored these graveyard mechanics and that area of design space to the point of near ubiquity. Indeed, despite the theory, it could be argued that the point of the graveyard is not to make you lose access to cards, but gain it. Again, lending credence to the idea of it being a second hand. Here's a couple examples. In Yu-Gi-Oh, most top strategies make use of the graveyard in some way. So even though nothing in the rules of the game requires you to interact with it, beyond putting destroyed cards in, of course, the fact that it's printed in nearly every archetype on most good cards doesn't really leave you with much of a choice. Yu-Gi-Oh! gets both dedicated Graveyard Matters archetypes like Tear Laments or Lightsworn, as well as archetypes that only incidentally make use of the Graveyard for a couple of their effects, kind of out of convenience. For another example, in Pokémon it's not the issue of volume, but quality. Most cards don't care about the graveyard, that's true, there's some Pokémon that specifically do, like Regidrago V-Star, but there's a couple very good and very splashable neutral cards that can go into many different decks and interact with the graveyard, like Energy Retrieval, Super Rod or Palpod in the current meta. So in practice, it's not a core mechanic, but it's popular to the point where it might as well be. Even though the core rules of these games might leave you with the impression that the yard is a place where nothing happens, your lived experience playing matches may leave you with the opposite impression, that it's a place of lively activity. So we know what the graveyard is, we know that most card games explore it in a way that kind of shifts its initial purpose on its head and gives birth to many, many graveyard interaction cards. Let's now discuss these cards for a bit. First of all, from a narrative standpoint, the graveyard, unlike some other zones, has flavor. Hand and deck don't really have a thematic layer in most games. Magic tries to include one, with the deck being your spell library and your hand being the spells that you hold in your consciousness at a given moment, but that's always seemed kind of paper thin to me. What happens on the battlefield, however, is flavored. It's battle. That's the field where battle happens. But as the ever-growing list of MTG creature types shows us, nearly anything can be involved in battles, so that's a very broad theme. But when these combatants die and go to the graveyard, that really constrains what we can do with it narratively. Because that narrative space is constrained to what we can do with dead stuff. So, necromancy, regeneration, composting, resurrection, maybe a bit of scavenging cannibalism, perhaps. This is both a good thing, because constrained narrative options allow for coming up with ideas more easily, you know, the curse of the blank page, and a bad thing, because if you want to put graveyard interaction into an archetype that doesn't connect to any of the ideas above, you'll have to sweat for it a bit. On the mechanical side, I find that there are three pillars of graveyard interaction. Cards that return or recur stuff from it. Cards that care about stuff entering it, which depending on how specific your game of choice is on wording, might be equivalent to on death slash death rattle effects, but it might also not. And the third one is cards that care about stuff being in the graveyard. Either the quantity, like Shadows in Shadowverse or the MTG Mechanic Threshold, or from a different perspective, the MTG Mechanic Delve, where you need a certain count of cards to be there because you can use them as mana, or you can have cards that care about the variety of cards in the graveyard, like Tarmogoyf. But you might also get cards that activate when they themselves are in a graveyard. Effects like MTG's Anger or a Plethora of effects in Yu-Gi-Oh! 
In systems and metas, where multiple of these pillars exist, they can't really be unentangled, I find. That's especially the case for the enablers. Builder cards for one pillar will usually allow the enablement of other. Enablement is probably not a word. They will allow the enabling of another. So despite the three looking like separate avenues for exploring graveyard-related design, the resulting idea space, the resulting design space will be usually smaller than anticipated, as their enablers will look very similar. Effects that put cards into your graveyard quickly and plentifully for the most part. We can of course print more of these, but they will end up competing with each other if there's too many. If it only makes sense for a graveyard deck to play, say, 12 graveyard stuffing effects, any more will either be situational replacements or redundant. And even the pay of cards exist within what MTG's Mark Rosewater referred to as deep but narrow scope of design. Which means you can have a multitude of slightly different effects, often slightly different in interesting ways kind of plays on the same general idea, but the distance between the two most different graveyard cards will never be massive. The strategies they create will also be self-contained for the most part. They will combo mostly with other graveyard cards and will often be the main attraction of decks that feature them. Graveyard strategies often gravitate towards value playstyles with the main method of getting rid of your stuff being way less effective when you can just bring it back, it will be hard to run you out of resources, which plays well into those value playstyles. This will most often be balanced at the cost of speed. Bringing these cards back will take resources and tempo, giving your opponent a chance to end you while you're attempting to recycle your game pieces. However, a critical mass of graveyard cards may also meld into the shape of a combo. An example is MTG's Goryeo's Vengeance. I feel like these are rarely intended by the designers, but rather emerge organically out of the Venn diagram of all the upsides given to graveyard-related cards over the years. These strategies, rather than methodically recycling the contents of their yards, use it as a temporary holding place for a huge overcosted bomb, until they are ready to shoot it directly at their opponents. The appeal is either being able to forego paying the associated costs when reviving the card rather than playing it normally, or the increased chance of seeing a particular card in your deck that comes with being able to mill cards faster than you would draw them. The main characteristic of the graveyard they care about is it appearing in the text of cards that enable the combo, they couldn't care less. If they could hold that finisher elsewhere to cheat it out, they would. On the player psychology side, players who don't enjoy facing graveyard mechanics might do so out of a sense of futility. This applies especially to the value-based playstyles. They transform a generally good thing, putting your opponent's stuff out of commission, into more fuel for your opponent's cards, so your efforts fighting for board presence might seem in vain. Using the GY as a second hand may also seem like an unfair circumvention around drawing cards being limited or difficult in your card game of choice. For players who subscribe to this notion, they themselves seem to work really hard and pay premium to draw random cards from the deck, while the yard-based opponent just stuffs their discard with a smattering of cards for cheap and then plucks whatever they need out of it. Even if the two methods of getting access to cards are appropriately costed and balanced, it might be hard to appreciate that mid-match. There's also balancing hurdles. It's hard to design graveyard effects that will be good in moderation, but won't become overpowered in a deck optimized to fill the graveyard ASAP. It's no wonder that strategies that utilize it are often problematic to balance. In his article about designing mechanics for the graveyard-centric Golgari guild, Mark Rosewater mentions that he tested 40 different graveyard mechanics, most of which ended up either broken, underpowered, or otherwise boring. Graveyard hate 
the cards we use to combat graveyard strategies also very often happen to be binary. Supremely effective when your opponent needs the yard, and you have an answer to that need, but that's often balanced out by them being fully dead in non-graveyard matchups. And having dead cards is one of the worst feelings in CCGs. That either makes them sideboard material, a risky meta call, or a potential mainboard index that can run multiple tech cards without being slowed down. Magic attempted to print cards that I dub incidental hate pieces, cards like Scavenging Ooze, Immersturm Predator, Author of Shadows. When playing against graveyard strats, especially combo, they can be used as those surgical hate pieces, but they are mostly balanced to not turn off the opponent's entire strategy. But otherwise, when facing a deck that just doesn't care about what's in the GY, they can also be used as value pieces, with the anti-graveyard portion of the effect being kinda superfluous. Another potential polarizing factor is the added complexity. You have to keep track of what's in another zone of play, potentially both yours and your opponent's. Card count, which cards they are, and potentially their order are some additional information which you can of course confirm by accessing the open information that is the graveyard, but that still requires you to commit part of your cognitive capacity to it. And unlike the spread out cards on the battlefield, the graveyard is generally a stack and needs to be laid out to be consulted, or, you know, clicked and scrolled if you're playing digital, which adds a tiny kinetic component to the mental one. And it gets even worse in games like Hearthstone, which doesn't have a public graveyard for some reason. Sometimes, if you weren't paying attention, you won't know which card you're resing. And you might say, skill issue, but sometimes you discover the res from a random discover effect, and you didn't know that you were supposed to be keeping track from the beginning of the match, because that's not a card that you've put in your deck. Let me know in the comments what your favorite cards having to do with the graveyard are. Interaction, hate pieces, whatever you like. Thanks a lot for watching, I've been Simon from... And I hope to see you in the next one.